Gentlemen, there's been this uh, quote floating around the internet the last few days about why a famous investor decided to get short. And I'm curious as to your take on this quote, and I'm going to place it at a certain point in time. Stanley Druckenmiller says in response to what determined the timing of your shift from bullish to bearish in the market. And he says it's a combination of a number of factors. Valuations have gotten extremely overdone. The dividend yields down at 2.6% and the price to book value ratio is at an all time high. The Fed's been tightening for a period of time and the technical analysis shows the breath wasn't there. That is the market strength is primarily concentrated in the high capitalization stocks with the broad spectrum of issues lagging well behind. This factor makes the rally look like a blow off. This isn't a quote from 2024. It's a quote from the summer of 1987. And there are a lot of parallels here. Price to book ratio right now in the market is sitting near five. The last time it was this high was January 2000. When we look at Fed tightening cycle, of course, that's there. When we think about the dividend yield of the market, it's below 2.6% right now, well below 2.6% right now, about 1.13%. So there's a lot of factors here that are echoing through the financial world that traders may feel like, yes, this is indeed the blow off top. NVIDIA going crazy, Avgo going crazy. This is all the end. It's the final rattle. It's the death rattle of the bull market. It's a siren song that I think is very alluring to call the top. I guess my question for you is, do you see any parallels between 1987 and today, having watched your tremendous documentary on uh, the 1987 crash a number of times. It's definitely a fair question to ask. The crazy thing is I, I think Tony and I both remember 1987 like almost like it was yesterday. I remember the summer of, I remember the year, like, you know, everything that was going on that year. I remember more than the month of the birth of my children. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's scary. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> well, it was before, it was pre-Nick. It was before both my kids were born. Mm -hmm. And I remember really everything about 1987. It was kind of nuts. So is it the same now as, as then? I don't well, think so. I don't think anything, like the hard thing is that the markets are so, so different now. Remember 1987, it was, the markets were tiny. I feel like you could fit the whole, the entire 1987 marketplace was smaller than one stock today, significantly smaller than one stock. I don't even think the stock market was even close to the total value was was even close to a trillion dollars. I don't think so. The point is, if you're talking about trading wise, no, I think there were slightly more violent rallies that scared me more. Just to put some context around it, 1987, 2008 for sure were times when I felt the markets were, mm -hmm. I felt the markets were way more out of control than they are right now. I feel this is incredibly orderly compared to where we were back then. 87, we lost order. 2008, we absolutely lost order. When I think of other times, 1999 was kind of crazy too. I'm going to give those three times the lead. And then and then right before the flash crash, it was kind of wild too. When the market had rallied for almost three straight years up to whatever it was, 2000. Is that March 9th, 2010 or something? I feel like kind of crazy too. I'm going to say those three other times, 1999, 2000, 2008 into 2009 and 1987 were all much more violent times than where we are today. It's too early. The structure of the market is different too, right? Yeah. We have circuit breakers. There were no circuit breakers then. There was also no skew, also no high frequency market making. And there were no real indexes at the time other than the S&P 500. I'm going to say that it's never the same. I mean, yeah, it's never the same. The, the, I don't even like to compare it. I actually remember that quote from Stanley Druckenmiller because a crazy thing happened in 1990. We actually started this advisory firm that, in addition to our trading, and we had some Stanley Druckenmiller money. So I remember, I remember his quotes and stuff like that. It was through a like a, it was just it wasn't it was down the line of his money. It wasn't like it wasn't his fund. It was like personal something like that. But we were managing like an index part of it. That that was the relationship. I, I kind of remember some of those quotes back then and all that kind of stuff. No, I, I don't think it was anything like today. I really don't. I think for traders who are looking at a quote like that and seeing some of the stars lining up, there's a temptation to say, oh, well, you know, volatility is low. I can buy a bunch of out of the money puts and swing for the stars or swing for the fences. That's not an analogy. But the point is. It's not really a viable trading strategy. I think Dylan's been saying recently in overtime, the world only ends once. And so to consistently try to time the end of the bull market, it could be an expensive endeavor. Um, that's not to say that there isn't any technical weakness setting into play. The uptrend that we've seen in both the S&P and the NASDAQ in the month of June appears to be cracking. I don't know how much of this is related to the end of the world coming, as so many people are assuming with this Miller quote, or if it's just because it's the end of the month. 
there's been some healthy rotation in stocks over the past few days. Even the equal weighted NASDAQ is pressing up against all-time highs. It's struggling there, but it's pressing up against all-time highs. And the breadth in this market is actually pretty good. About 65% of stocks are trading above their 200-day moving average. 63% of stocks are trading above their 20-day moving average. Not a historically high level by any stretch of the imagination. So right now, yes, there are problems to worry about. Stocks have gone a very, very long way, a long way for traders who are operating on a short-term basis, not for everyday mom-and-pop people. The market has barely gone anywhere since the start of 2022, and we just just set new all-time highs. And for the first time in two plus years, most people who have stock holdings in this country are seeing that their account is at a new all-time high. And that's making them feel good. That's not the environment that people start to uh, divest from their equity holdings. So if the market is going through a crash, we're going to see it in real time. It's not going to appear overnight thinking that we're going to have a Black Monday or Black Tuesday or Black Friday. It's pretty unlikely given the way that the table set. Now, this week is interesting because we have French elections, Tom, and I imagine that you're very into the French elections. But we've seen over the past 15 years that French elections, UK elections, they can ultimately move our markets. They can spill into the bond market here. And it's a risk that traders should be aware of. Will it catalyze something like what Drucker Miller talked about? Probably not. But it can be a source of weakness, particularly next week when we have thinner liquidity around the holidays. I don't think the French elections will move our markets at all. I don't think they ever have. Our markets are very focused on on us. We used to wake up in the middle of the night and say, what's going on in Japan? And that was in the 80s. And then we'd say, what's going on in China? What's going on in, you know, in Europe and things like that? And I think I got the first email last week that I've gotten a long time, which said, hey, kid, is there any way to trade like the London markets? And I'm like, no, they, they, had, they had FTSE futures for like, a week before they realized nobody would trade them. We are probably the only country in the world where we really don't care what happens in the rest of the world. It's kind of scary. And I don't think that French elections or anything like that, I don't think they're gonna have any impact on to our markets. I think it is reasonable to assume that, hey, we've come a long way in the last couple of years, and it's not a crazy stretch to say that we're gonna pull back a little bit here. That's not a stretch at all. I, I think, I don't think anybody should be surprised by this market you know, potentially getting ugly here or something. Ha I, I don't know why that would surprise anybody. I just don't, I don't see it as no, a... I, I, Tony, I shared this in the uh, the research chat on Teams uh, last week, but we got to a point last week where the S&P 500 was more than 3% above its one month moving average, which from the low in October, 2022, that had only happened 30 times previously. The one week returns to the stock market after seeing that type of overbought level was a negative 0.38% on average. A month later, however, the market was up 1.02% on average. So we've gone a little far, but if this is a, a market that's behaving in the same characteristic form and function that it has been over the past few years, then this is a buy the dip opportunity. And we have the best two weeks of the year, historically speaking, coming up starting next week. First two weeks of July of any two weeks of the entire year produce the best return for markets over the past 10 and 20 years. So a small dip here that we're seeing these last few days I am uh, waiting, watching to lap it up and buy it up as soon as I possibly can. I don't share the same enthusiasm as you do for for what we're for what's happening in the next two weeks. That's for sure. I think we're just at a we're at this crazy summer point right now where the market doesn't want to roll over yet. But I just don't love the upside. I don't think it's worth the risk. I mean, who's going to be the leader to the upside? That'd be my biggest question. I think Nvidia's kind of blown its brains out, if that's fair. So who's going to be the leader? Is it the problem for most people looking at this saying that it's only been a handful of stocks that have been carrying the market higher? Period of time where we see some of the winners, the leaders get take down a peg and the rest of the market moves sideways or up would be very, very healthy and would take away that market capitalization argument in that Druckenmiller quote. Do I have a particular stock in name? No, Tom, if I knew which is going to be the leader for the next three months, I would be doing all that and be sitting on a beach somewhere. Right? I have no idea. I do think the setup is looking a lot like last summer where you get through July and you think about the summer months. OK, August is typically bad. September is usually bad. Now we have elections here. The market tends to get a little tensed up ahead of that. Yeah, I think there is a correction coming this fall, but we still have some time before the music turns off. And until the punch bowl runs out, I will continue to party. He's a closet bull. He is. You're Sounds a closet, like a closet bull. bull. I mean, what was that? What What did you listen the to number me? When we get over over overbought by this three percent, we return. We usually lose zero point three eight. Did you say? And one week later, 0.38%, and then one month later, nothing. higher That's by 1.02%. Not a daily move, right? To be fair, I don't hate the position. I don't hate the position since he's been a bull all along. I see no reason why you would sure. change your 
position unless the market forces you to, and I don't think the market's forced you to. So I see no reason why you should change. You know, like, I mean, if you're bullish, why you would you not be? Shake, shook out anywhere. Shook it out. We haven't even had a... Downtick, right. Exactly. I, we haven't had a 2% down move in what? They said, you know, 100 years? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever it is. It's been what? Almost, no. 300, 396 trading days, I think. Something, yeah, that something like that. Yeah, it's, all, it's over a year. Mm -hmm. I haven't had a 2% down move. I mean, it's crazy. NASDAQ. And this doesn't even crack. This is only the fifth largest streak that we've had in history. We've seen much longer streaks than this. Yeah. Um, I don't, yeah. It, election years to me are weird. Um, going back, you know, like, like 2000 was an election year. 2008 was an election year. Definitely had some reversals in election years. I think we pointed that out before, you know, 2020. I mean, they, they could be caused by pandemics or whatever else, but we've had weird things happen in election years. I don't remember 2012 that much. I kind of remember 2016, but election years are, they're different. They're different. 88 was an election year, 92, 96. I, I feel like there's been some, some very big swings in the second half of the year, and it remains to be seen. We'll see. We will see. I don't know. I hate to, to, to do the prediction thing. I really do. Yeah. I mean, I know we have it. Uh, Friday is our second quarter results uh, for our SPX game. Um, and we'll take a look back on where I thought the market. I think was. you were 4,600 and something. I was 4,680 and you were like 46. Like 4,700 and I was 4,600 and change or something like that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think we're off by. 700 by a magnitude of almost a thousand points in the s p's in just half a year right right right. that shows how bad we are right and when you think about that how could you be off by 20 percent in half a year 